Uh, Inge, can I start? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our going public lecture series. It's already the 36th lecture in the series that we will have tonight. My name is Jo van den Berge. I am the curator of the legacy engagement, of the master program in architecture. And on behalf of the faculty of architecture, I'm very happy to introduce to you tonight Tom De Power. Uh, Tom is an architect who will talk about a house and a garden comprised of various reclaimed buildings and grounds, the subject of the presentation. Also the title of the presentation, House and Garden. Uh, Tom, born in London, grew up in the west of Ireland, graduated from University, University College in Dublin with first class honors in 1991. In that year, he won the commission for a visitor center at Ballincolic County York in Ireland and commenced his practice. His work includes public buildings, spaces, landscape, private houses, gardens and furnitures. He has won national and international awards. So Tom lives and works in Greystones County Wicklow in Ireland. He has been a lecturer at University College Dublin and has been a regular visiting critic and lectured at schools of architecture nationally and internationally, including the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Tom has also uh, been selected to make the inaugural Irish Pavilion at the 7th International Architecture Biennale in Venice in the year 2000 and subsequently represented Ireland in 2006, 2008 and 2010 when he co-curated and designed the exhibition and was invited to present his work in the international exhibition, the Central Pavilion in Venice. So, uh, I will quote Andrew Clancy when he writes, our island, which is Ireland in that case, our island is not so much densely inhabited as densely remembered, densely imagined. So exploring the architecture, cities and landscapes of the islands of Ireland the architecture of Tom de Power is perhaps the most powerful and evocative example of this imagined Ireland. And how beautiful does that sound? Imagined Ireland. So dear Tom, on behalf of the whole faculty, I want to thank you for accepting my invitation and for sharing your work and your thoughts with us in this late November evening. Uh, so I invite you to climb on the stage to talk. And after your talk, there is time and space for questions and answers in person. Could everybody hear me? Loud and clear, everything works. All right. Okay, Tom, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Lovely introduction. Thank you, Inge. Thank you to the faculty. Uh, I hadn't thought about it that way, but yeah, imagining Ireland. Okay, let's do it that way. I think that's a good idea. Um, uh, I'm going to show, I'm, I don't know, it's, it is quite strange speaking into the, into the firmament. I don't know how many people are there or whatever, but I'm, I'm going to just show, I haven't really done this talk before. This is a project that I've been working on for about 15 years, really, often very much by myself. I don't, uh, often not really knowing what one was doing um, and not really having any audience. Uh, often working in terrain that's kind of unknown, such as planting uh, or, 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 or digging or, or um, casting concrete or um, 
So, uh, so the kind of broadband of experimentation was quite wide and there was a lot of time spent. Uh, time was a great luxury in it. And the, imp and the kind of promise of it, I suppose, going back to Joe's introduction there via Andrew, is uh, like all gardens, really. I think the garden is more important than the actual objects of the buildings, but, they, but the garden must be inhabited. But, the, but that the garden is artificial, that it is fundamentally as artificial as it possibly can be in this, quote, um, landscape. Um, so, uh, and then that spatially, the ordering of it uh, makes it as complex as possible. So <clears throat> it's one acre, and it's one acre down bottom left of your slide there. You can see a little red Tom, mark. Tom, I think you still need to share your screen. Oh, you can't see my screen. No. All right. Sorry. Here we, here we are. Sorry. So this picture is um, uh, 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 north to the right. So top of the drawing is the sugar loaf, which is Ireland's kind of Mount Fuji, if you like. It's a very perfect, um, perfect um, quartzite mountain. And then at the bottom is the is the Irish Sea. Um, um, and if you look on the bottom left, you just see a little red mark there in a place called Wingates. So that's the site. Um, it was, a, <clears throat> it was a, a yard, it was a farmyard originally for all those lands that are there, which have been swallowed up to the south by uh, suburban, suburban edge of Greystones, and it then became a builder's yard. So, um, no. Why can't I change slides? Change. So oh, as yeah. can yeah. you see that? Yeah. yeah. So as, as found, um, looking east, um, a kind of a bow tie in plan of a suite of buildings, all in in situ concrete from from around 1905. Uh, some though had infill in with precast concrete blocks and a very big hay barn that you see on the right. And uh, so the whole thing, a kind of a closed compound uh, uh, walled um, with a couple of geometries on the site that are sort of interesting. So you can see it here when it was cleared that you had this kind of vernacular of uh, well, of a, cer a certain kind of cl classical vernacular, but out of concrete, uh, generally, and then the hay barn. So the first procedure was to clear it and then to think about what pieces were to remain and what pieces were to go. And I suppose, to my mind, going back to the introduction, I was kind of interested in trying to, I suppose, make a fiction to, to kind of to go beyond its that to go beyond the kind of state of it being a charming, if that was possible, um, farmyard aesthetic into something that was maybe closer to Delphi or something about objects in a landscape that's that, that's topological. Um, so across this site, from top to from the road behind you down to the sea, there's a 14 meter fall. So basically, uh, the idea was to actually. I found that. I didn't like standing on a hill, albeit a shallow one, that I liked steps. So, so I terraced the entire site. And that made microclimates and, and, and uh, gave it a spatial order. So that's looking back up. And then the hay barn was taken away um, reluctantly. Um, so you can see it here uh, as, uh, from the Ordnance Survey map as this kind of bow tie where you've got a, a garden to the north and a garden to the south, basically an orchard, and in between it a courtyard um, of found objects. So I, I, I trained like you have um, in, um, in architecture and didn't really know anything about ground or, or planting and so on, but had a fascination with, you know, work like Derek Jarman's in Dungeness or Little Sparta and so on, and the relationship between, between these kind of made spaces. So these are kind of notebooks that were just from that time of just trying to figure out how, how to work with 
these found objects and this kind of found place and how it could be cleared. So forgive me if I show you a few of them, um, but you can see on the top left where there's kind of ideas of enclosure and where can where can one exploit um, some of the formalities of the found object. And then just ideas about moving moving Earth around. Um, what's, what, what's a wall? What's an object? Um, where's the point of view? How do people move? Uh, uh, re realizations that hedges are very fast walls. Then what's a good hedge? You've got yew hedges, beech hedges, um, you know, there's many different kinds. So, for instance, all the be all the yew hedges on the site run, so run um, north south, and all the beech hedges run east west because they're deciduous. So you have this natural field pattern superimposed directly onto the project. So all the planting actually in the garden now is ordered um, in the way that you would order any material on an architectural plan. Everything is oriented the same way as it should be anyway. You know, you're going to put agapantha in, you're going to put them in facing south. So you have south facing runs of agapantha and, and so on right the way through. Um, so, that, so suddenly the project becomes a kind of, if you like, Broadway boogie woogie of, 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 of spatial order, orders right, right, right from the get go. And then the, and then the, the twist happens where it, hits, where it hits the kind of geometry of essentially the, the medieval field pattern. And then little things like in these kind of landscapes, you know, 250 mil is a is a hill and a valley or 900 can make a huge difference in a point of view. So I realized that I could start to cut, as we were saying, the, the, the hill um, without having to get planning permission. One can move ground uh, up to a meter and one can build a garden wall up to two meters. So within that jurisdiction, I didn't go for planning permission for any of the works you're going to see. Everything is in the code or is in between the code. Um, so you can see here, I don't know if I, I can I, I I can point. Can you see my cursor? Yes, Tom, we yeah. can see it. Yeah. OK, yeah. so the reading is very simple. This long range here and there, this is a little hen house and this long range here, they kind of make if I cut the ground, if I demolish this building here at the day work joint at 900, I can take that level and retain everything in here as a lower garden, almost like, almost like a cloister with a cloister garden, and this is a lavabo. So in a way, the image here is of a monastery, but a monastery, perhaps a version of a monastery, let's say, spatial order of a, of a monastery, but in a hot, a hot, um, florid place. This is a kitchen garden, south facing again. This is a courtyard between what's called the office and the loft. This is a new building, which isn't built, but the foundations are built. And then this is a long range of, 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 of existing buildings that have been adjusted. Now I'm gonna show you several versions of the plan. This is the first version, but it's still got the ideas in it. Uh, but the plan, each plan you see is a slightly different one. So up here then, so then just very simply, what happens in my logic is that all, everything down here is limestone. Everything up here is granite because of the mountain, even though it's quartzite. But there was a big pile of granite on the site. So automatically then this becomes a woodland and has a different kind of chemistry um, by its material order. And so on, so does this one. And then so does this space in between, this courtyard in between. And so do these little pocket gardens here and this terrace here. And then this links out into the fields. Um, so, so basically the kind of the, the, the site all the material of the site that's kept is then reordered, like bits of steel sections become steps down here and so on. Granite, as I say, goes up here, limestone comes down here. So the thing starts to actually build up a micro, material microclimates, if you like, um, within themselves in each of these places, as well as, of course, having this fantastic thing where the, pro, where the project has the sun going around it so it's it's changing all the time so you so you have a kind of diurnal quality to play with which you often don't do let's face it in architecture so i can i can actually organize i can organize my day as i move around this thing like this and end up here starting here um so walls hortus conclusus so we make we, we i walled the existing 
orchard up to two meters at its lowest point, which then falls away. So you start driving, driving this new order right through the, the um, found um, courtyard. You can see the orchard behind it there. And then it makes a new, a new kind of horizon against the sea and then traps a microclimate behind it. And then also allows me then to retain and have, have the ground change behind that again. So you get this thing about moving around it. And then it opens apart. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't really close at all around the existing apple trees. And then here, they, here they, it is a little bit later on where the steel is starting to move in and trying things out, trying to find a way of moving around it. Here it is today. Um, now this has become an echium garden down, down below you here. And there's a lot of work still to be done down here. But this is this basically long strip is almost there. And then the cloister is here. So the gap then, actually the gap then orders a, a cut through the, the long range. And uh, I mean, one of the things that I tried to do is look for the longest points of view across the site and exploit those to make it feel bigger where I could. So you, so you get this kind of thing now across the orchard. And that wall leads right up to what is called a studio. So this new wall that comes in at the top of this wall, whoops. This wall here is at the, sets out this wall here, which goes right the way around the project and dies in here. So suddenly there's a new datum, and these buildings then sit on top of on top of that datum, and the space is kind of formed between them. Uh, and then you can put things on top of that, like so the where the building is demolished, that becomes all the rubble. So we fill that, and um, and it makes a new terrace. And of course, then I make an earth pyramid there. Uh, which starts to kind of make a new situation um, with the Hebes against these. This then becomes a pond. This becomes a, a little grotto garden. And then this becomes a room that's outside and above it becomes ultimately a bedroom. And you can slip down into this kind of woven space, which is very kind of urban, actually, the dimension of it, um, and very kind of enjoyable against this, let's say, surrealist garden, which then pro pops out and looks out over the farmland. So then within that, then one can start to make ponds so that uh, actually, because this hill is very dry, all the water flies off it. Um, so I made three big basins, which are filled uh, with some earth and water so that they actually kind of, they basically retain rainfall and um, again, help me to grow ferns and so on in various situations and um, gone around and whatnot. But so basically they become climactic devices as well as kind of engineering or re-engineering the groundscape as well as making reflections and whatnot. They also bring insects and birds. So these kind of little sketches, you can see the bottom one is kind of promising that stepped garden and the pond there. And you can see the, the, the the chopping up of the long range of buildings there to release the wall behind. So that pond becomes this now. Um, I One of the things that was difficult, I think, is that the long range had a beautiful facade, but it was too, it was a really beautiful facade. It looked like, you know, it was, um, it was sort of dour and, um, um, and continuous, but I wanted to break it apart. So I just took off a broken lintel on the right and then I had this piece of angle from an old stairs and put it on the top and suddenly it kind of turns into some sort of funny um, kind of ninja temple or something with the water. It reverses, it reverses the facade, it makes a front and a back to it and steps it forward, which, which kind of made a place in that very large order. Um, so again, little drawings, that kind of thing, and trying to figure out what plants work. I see there, this hookeranium there that would never have worked or and it, in fact it didn't work because the ground was alcohol is very very alkaline and you know little trying to work with those existing bits of building that are incredible mass concrete no rebar you can cut them they fall apart on the corners because the water runs down the hill and erodes their foundation so you have to strap them together so what i started to do was pour floors into them which are interlocked into, into the 
into the parent concrete, if you like, like Lego. And so you bind the whole, all the four walls together. That's what you're seeing there. Um, and that's what you're seeing here, in fact, where, where you can see a, the slab comes through and distressed a bit as, as a stairs and comes through and connects, ties all this stuff together. And then bits of it are replastered and bits of the plaster are cut away and bits of it uh, is entirely actually um, chemical anchor, just stitching the whole thing together. And then it's kind of painted and it's bits of it are cut, like where you start to draw into the concrete with an angle grinder and then paint it. So it starts to imply false narratives about what's new and old and what's on top of another and so on. And, um, and it becomes um, something that um, ultimately has no truth. Uh, in in the in the in, in the sense of construction, um, and bits of it get painted and be, bits of it don't, and it's um, very, very um, kind of compelling process. And um, you know that thing about just well objects and what happens underground. But this is the little lavabo, which which is ultimately a little bedroom, but it hasn't it hasn't been roofed yet. But it's just the primitive hut, I, I think, in a funny kind of a way. And so it's, it, it's really within the tradition, I think, of the, the tea house, you know, and that uh, one would have a, a retired feudal um, 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 uh, warrior uh, doing watercolours in there and writing haikus and walking around with a towel over his or her shoulder in an orchard. Uh, that's what it ultimately might happen. But... So, but initially what happened was we just organized this cloister of stones just to feel stones around it so you get between the walls now and the old walls you get a cut and it starts to open up layering and this becomes an object in the space and you get this um cloister just of field stones that you can walk around in amongst the trees so this is all kind of cutting and here it is kind of today uh it needs some work on the right obviously but you can kind of see the way that it's happening Again, that's it from the, so you can see here, this building is just being saw cut. Um, 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 it's just all, it's all, it's all kind of edit. And some of it remains the same and there's more to do to it, to cut it further, I think, and more to add to it. But, but, it, but then where the floors are cut away, you can control the growth of bamboos. So there's Farsija in there. So this whole range now has cut floors so that I can grow bamboo bamboos, very invasive bamboos, uh, and keep them under control. So basically, it's all its floor plate has been cut away, um, just leaving a way to move between them. And then you get ferox, and, uh, um, uh, and again, more kind of cutting on the far side. Uh, so then, the, this, this is a little sketch of the office. So the office, needed a facade because it used to have a it used to have a trucks going into it and so it need it and in fact the loft um needed bits of new facade as well so any new facade i put in like a letterbox joint you know, or a letterbox pour so it's 200 mil in front of the face so you can get the concrete in so you so you basically apply it like a mask literally onto the existing object so it can have its own order its own intelligence its own kind of imagination if you like because it's applied directly onto it and it doesn't have to um, it doesn't have to uh, really respond to the found object and then within planning terms as long as it I think the quotation is as long as it um, is in the same spirit it's okay um, so this little sketch shows the facade and it, it's where it's the moment when um, it's the first time I can't remember what happened, but the place didn't have an the place didn't have a name. It was always just called Darcy's Yard, so it was associated with the house next door. So it didn't have a name in its own right, and it seemed like you know, like it's like Leica or something going into outer space. It has to have a name. Um, um, so the desert desert is the original spelling of desert, which is. Desert, which is dicert in Hiberno English, and desert in in um, in this in this sense is uh, there's a lot of dicerts in our in in Ireland. It's where um, monks would go off by themselves in the you know sixth and seventh century. They were anchorites, 
and they would go into the desert like the like the um Egyptian fathers they would go into the desert but it would be a very wet desert in the west coast of Ireland there's lots of disertolas and so on so desert means a completely different thing in Ireland um, it doesn't mean sandy thing at all it means a place to of solitude or and a refuge or a reimagined Ireland if you like so that's that's so then I bush hammered I cut I, cu I drew it I drew so that's the hieroglyphic of desert that's dessert <laughs> in um in Egyptian but it's missing the 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 the, the, the hill on the right hand side and this little so this little quote is just it's just really i mean it's just a sweet thing it's just about it just says dysert sometimes spelled sometimes with an e is a withdrawal westwards from the gaelic desert from the latin desert from the mouth of the nile the clearing cut first in ditch then bank then cast as wall and backfilled depicted without vowels the place name is part elevation and part plan the address read Reads top left. Oh, I should have this image. Sorry. Depicted without vowels, the place name is part elevation and part plan. The address re read right to left, top down. The hand of the hieroglyph printed orange indicates D over an oblong in relief, a reservoir which makes sh before the lips which pour the R of sugarloaf to the T of dessert, a retreat between the point of a small mountain and the line of a sea cross-section and endearment the sign is the shape of the sound of the place so uh, you know it's again a construction of an imagination so you know like the, they did find a papyrus in the uh, in the in the leaves of a of a of, 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 of a bible in the bog in ireland like you know so so there are so the the idea that there are coptic monks knocking around in this location um is not uh it's not infeasible and i think that a, a lot of gardens actually do fabricate mythology so um it, it's forgivable perhaps anyway it's the dessert it's the it's the, it's the address and you need one and there it is the, i just cut cut it in lately the actual determinative which is the sugar loaf of course and you know cutting cu cu cutting concrete and uh, like this and drawing with concrete is really good fun so, um so that's its original facade and then this is this is it when it was put on straight away and you can see that the concrete was terrible so i needed to do something with it to draw it so here are the drawings you can see top right the wireframe a door and a window both the same size one up one down and then this um drift upwards with the with the inscription in it um the other the other facade down below is is maybe more significant but you can see that they the this little building is actually very nice very nice in terms of its um its proportions so here it looks like now with a massive zigzag garden that comes to the front door down the hill um so door to the right window to the left and this is just a rain chain um of the loft beside it it's uninsulated um uninsulated uh other than the floor inside. It had a strange plan, just a, a, a wall down the middle of it. So it kind of added a bit to it. Um, yeah, you can see it here. The wall was driven down the middle. So I just made a new kind of a toilet kitchen in concrete. And then the library, as you can see it. And then this at the bottom wall was the, it was the pump house for the house next door. So you just cut that wall and put a stove into it. And then there's a sort of a studio. And uh, these drawings are quite old, and so I got an attic then on the on the first floor underneath that roof. But well, these drawings are not quite up to date. But you can see, so you get this kind of big T with a toilet shower in there, and the entrance on the other side, and an attic overhead. And then it's just doing things very in a very direct way, kind of fascinated with the rough, new and old concrete. And then secondhand basins and bits of plumbing just done very directly and um, lines of paint and gravel for the floor. So this actually, this, this is a revision where you can see that this suddenly becomes the door, you know, Duchamp's Roularie door. Well, this is three of them together, all co-opting to make a toilet and a shower and, uh, and a mirror and, and a one-way glass. So you can sit in the, you can sit in the toilet with D8 closed 
and D6 open and look down the garden because it's a one way mirror, for instance, or you can sit on the toilet and close the, sh close the double doors and have a shower and so on. So it, 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 um, it becomes a quite a playful little thing um, within, within, within the space. And then the space is just very direct, just enjoying aggregates and enjoying paint and enjoying silver paint is great on um, concrete, but like hammerite is just really, really great somehow. And um, fooling around with um, color and so on. And then casting floors in that that will take the, just making a kind of St. Jerome in his study um, sort of a moment where there's a, there's, a, there's a stove on the left and there's this window. Well, that's it without any glass, but actually that's what we went for in the end. And then, that, and, and then ignoring the, the door to the adjoining property, which is no longer relevant. And so, and then putting floors in against that, very simple ways and putting rocks on top of that and just, you know, trying to make miniature landscapes within the kind of order of the building that's in another landscape and, and, and so on. You know, and you're reusing bits and pieces of plywood and old pieces of oak and so on to make this kind of day bed thing. Um, which sits like a throne opposite the opposite the opposite the stove, and then bookcases, which are boxes within boxes within boxes. Yeah, there's nothing new there, but you can see the plan of that. Just to, so suddenly you have a floor, you have a good floor of plywood, and you've got a concrete floor which now has a tap and a and a stove. So you make the you actually make the tea in the window, and then you have a you have a plywood floor and, a, and, and it's full of books. And then you have another space. So the, 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 the thing is kind of liberated by what it can't do. You know, and it's rough as rats in many ways and very enjoyable for that. Um, this doorway was too small, so we just smashed it out at the day work joint and you just get this kind of curious, curious relationship between the heads. So, so the door, so I put the windows on the outside um, I'll, with great respect to Sigurd Leverance. Um, you just, they're not as beautiful as Leverance's, but they're, they, 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 they admire, they admire, they, they admire, they admire clip and a great deal, but it's just an angle. It's just an angle with a, with a mastic joint, fixed glazing put on the outside. So it does, but then it's oversized, so you get the you get a square, which, which seemed logical. But with then within it, you get the vertical emphasis of the 1905 window, and you enjoy the framing of it, so to speak. And it does funny things on the inside. It's very nice, very enjoyable. And then you can cut holes in the in the mass walls. Um, you can see there on the right that the original builder has used an old piece of pipe in there. Um, so it, it's actually a very charming little building, a very nice building to be in, um, a studio for one or two or maybe three. That's the chimney going up through it. That's saw cut wall. Um, that would be looking at the, where the fire is. And then we put one, the new window in opposite the door, which is a very big, very, very big um, opening, D7, which does that. Um, so it means a it's kind of supercharged again back to the facade. And then it looks across at the loft and you can see the beginnings of like, there's a little forest of acers starting to happen there. And then that zigzag path that goes right the way up, up the site. And you can see um, that the old window, the old doorway and stairs, the stairs is gone and the door has turned into a sundial with a shelf. And then there's another piece of facade put in for the front door and there's an original window on the right and that the black is where it's insulated. So that, that building just on the site is just here. So we were in here, we're looking across here at this one here. So this one is in the round. So that's office. This building is for sleeping in and dining in. And then ultimately this building is a kitchen, just a kitchen with a lounge. And then there's another building. This building down here is a bedroom as well. So this is just a bedroom. And then this courtyard here is kind of like for guests. Um, so 
Yeah, this is these are just the facades. This is what we were talking about before. This is the facade to the road down here with the four the four windows sitting um, pretty like that. It's quite quite a, quite an amazing elevation. Um, this is a new opening that uh, was secreted in. This is the bathroom. This facade, uh, there was a small window in it here, but I made all the windows exactly the same. So they oversized. Again, they're on the outer face, but they're in the insulation. And that's the entrance as we as you saw it. So here I just put this in because it's, it starts to show you the consequences. That's two meters again of these changes of level. So it's fall, flat, fall, flat, fall. So suddenly, suddenly these buildings, which are kind of interesting, they're nice, they're simple buildings, but they start, they start to become set up and dramatized by the manipulation of the ground. Um, and you get front and back and you get sequencing and you, and you actually start to do things like you can then tilt heathers into the sun and, or you can, you know, you can make little parterres here and steps up through them, whatnot. So that's what it was like uh, at the beginning. So it was called a loft. It was, a, it was used as a secondhand clothes shop at one point, apparently. So again, you've an opening that needs to be closed and a door that needs to be closed and a window that's fine. And, and then so infill. And then you can see where the, the Lego floors has, have come through the facade to tie the whole thing together. So that the, these new concrete works hold the thing, hold the thing, hold all four walls together. And then what's happened is they've removed the interior completely and put a cruciform of new concrete inside it with a staircase. So the stairs has gone indoors. Um, and then it's, it's become a bit decorated, de decorated uh, again, bush hammering it and that stone over the door, which I think is kind of funny. Uh, um, and then the sundial has a little, another piece of stone on that shelf. But the plans now become, so all that's new, sorry, all that's old is the outer walls. Everything inside is new built. So you can see where it's snapped off here and snapped off here. And then obviously the insulation is around the outside. So it's pretty straightforward, hall, stairs up, bathroom, room, room. Up the stairs, which is underneath the kitchen, and into a, a big room with a stove in the corner. And you can walk, so this, this manifests itself as an object in the space with a new oak there. Um, these, these underneath the sink in W14 and W13, these take light from these two windows here and scoop them down to top light, top light the bathroom, which then has a bath, a sunken bath here with a window here, which is a sash and looks out. So, so then the, the windows don't really behave uh, with respect to the existing concrete. Oh. So there's a section, you can see that bath, there's the, the hall, and this you can see where the, the, the bathroom comes up underneath the, sit, the kitchen counter to, to, to borrow all of this light down. So it gives me a bit of section and allows this to read as an object, um, as a, you know, a closely packed dense object that liberates the rest of the free plan, if you like, which is a nice floor plate. It's seven meters by seven meters upstairs clear. And you can see then that, that, that the wash hand base and so on, they're all hung. So everything is hung, hung out of the slab. So just, you know, uh, some concrete stairs, which, uh, and then you get into this kind of thing where you've got um, super raw concrete, all bush hammered and cut, coming up, becoming kitchen slab, becoming pavement, becoming Carrara marble, flipping up to become day bed, picking up stove. But it's all the actions in the floor and the rest of it is as it was, essentially. And then so, the, so you, you iterate the floor as the counter, of course, and so on. And then that's the, those, that's the, vo these voids are down into the bath. So all the light is coming down that way. And then that's a big new window that was just put in there um, 
uh, were removed quietly. And then, so the so the black insulation that's a that's a acrylic insulation. I'm sure on on external acrylic render on external insulation. And then on the left is just asphalt on ply because um, it's one of the sheds. But so there's this moment where these black these black treatments kind of make these spaces between oneself kind of it's almost urban. Um, just these kind of pinched moments like this, where you get bits of roof on top of old walls and so on. And then that's a, that's a, that's a arbutus tree in between. And then the long views out back right out, we start to see the garden starts to stripe. And you can see what I was saying about all you hedges go in the same um, order. So I think I've got about three kilometers of you hedge like you can see it going down and down and down and down. it actually goes right down into the orchard into the corner there's no beach up there but the beach happens down down below and then it's starting to become kind of like that's um petisporum there that bronze thing with and these are deans and um and um, and prunus so it's starting to become very much about bronzes and reds up in this garden which is kind of interesting and then all the granite that i was talking to you about bits of found slabs making pavements and so on so this is kind of what it was. So it's becoming actually more, dare I say it, ornamental and kind of um, stranger. Uh, you know, it, it started life as kind of wanting to be a nice woodland, but it's it's now it's becoming much more like an Edwardian garden, I think. So this is another site plan. You can it's changed a bit. Uh, it's very faint, I'm afraid, um, but I just put it in for the just for the record of. But you can see the ponds are here now. One, two, three, and you can see the these sheds are starting to work, and you can see a little bit of detail on this house, this building here, which the foundations are in. Nothing really to say about these, and it's faint, but that garden is beginning to kind of happen, as indeed you can see the pyramid there and so on. But then this one, this drawing kind of gets a little bit closer. It's not a very, it's not a big. Close to over the year is that 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 it's all about the diagonal. When you're up here, that it's it's all in this pinch point and the long views. And I, I thought originally it was orthogonal to this, or else it was the angles, which is kind of like a, a French brock kind of planning, which takes out this geometry, the field geometry, and this order here. But actually, the whole thing now spatially re reconvenes on these lines onto either the corner onto the corners, everything, even if it's in this geometry, the, th the three-dimensional experience is this way, which really, really surprises me. And But now, but with that realization, you start to reread the whole thing. Um, so you can see that you can see the order of the planting of the hedges that are making rooms within rooms within rooms and so on. And you can see that it's a way then to kind of break down the composition. And it also means that as you stand south and look north or north looking south, you can you it joins the space visually and it mounts up as you look northwards or it mounts downward and layers um, um, towards the sea. So it's kind of it's kind of an enjoyable device. So here's the kitchen garden starting to happen. This is a, a um, this is the orchard just kind of just I like it. I like this. this is a quince tree. So there you can see the sheds. So the little concrete sheds that were cut away, they need they then needed roofs just to stop being ruins, to just kind of imply a bit of function, to just, you know, you could leave things there. It's just the kind of beginning of inhabitation. So we made a bunch of these little very simple roofs, which um which just kind of just sort of bring it, they bring them into bring them into use again and they're just made with um uh six by two sections screwed together um pretty silly um and they just span off off the existing walls of what's left of that that shed and and then they hang and again it's just torch on and painted black so it's a it's like a very i suppose it's like a it's like a Uh, a very uh, 
um, you put it on the foundations. And I think that's what's happening much of the time, that I, you, you just cut out the middle ground of walls, just think about them as foundations. And then it's just, it's just foundations and roofs. And you, you know, they, they become perfectly useful, um, um, rickety uh, outdoor workspaces in yards, which is nice. And they, they obviously can slide off then and become entrances and porches and all of these things as well, which so it allows, they allow, they're, they're allowed to kind of become propelia or gestures and within the sequencing of the space like this. So cut back, push forward. Again, you can see this in the end one as well. It, um, so it, it slides off just to make a courtyard, a tiny little garden within a garden at the top and just to liberate that facade, which or the, the pediment because it's so nice and particularly you can see it with the sugar loaf and it allows the room to be symmetrical within itself and then the plaster isn't really touched sometimes it's scudded sometimes it's just left raw and sometimes it's plastered where we needed to where it was badly cracked it's a little bit compositional but it's got it's got it, it, i kind of enjoy the the way that um you get you get all the different textures so these are just little drawings so what's happening here is that the pink is steel and these are the openings so they they are all clamped they all tie together to the steel frame which is clamped to the floor and holds the building together so it's basically like um you know de dentistry the big clamps in the apertures of the windows are tied back into the frame and uh that's tied down to a new concrete floor and then the building is underpinned so you can see it here so there's a frame up there that holds the roof that ties the walls together and then it's bolted down onto the floor and that's the structure and the floor then is cast right through and the walls are retained so you get it so then that room becomes a glass room so that steel frame that holds up holds everything together is then glazed and that's it with the, with the walls and the situation that they're in at the moment and that's that little that's that little terrace and i just and then i'm going to paint that on the inside that um, pyramid or that um pitch um silver so again starting to fool around with the relative position of the glass like this time I need glass, but I don't, I needed lots of air. And I, so I keep it off the face completely. So all it's doing is keeping the rain out. And um, because down there I'm growing ferns. So it starts to, we start doing things like this, where you infill the existing oak with an oak, which then has the ghost of a window borrowed from the building further up. And then on top of that, you put glazing separately. And then you, you know, you're going to end up writing, maybe doing John Don or something, writing on the on the facade. But oops, sorry. You know, so you're getting this kind of thing where you're getting scud coat, you're getting raw concrete, uh, you, you're getting raw concrete from 1905, you're getting some concrete from 19, I don't know, 2005, and then you're getting um, distressed uh, plaster that's repaired at the top, and then you're getting that that metal piece that's coming right through. And tying the whole thing in so it doesn't fall outwards and then this is cut out this is the grotto from below and then the, and then the last little building here is flooded because it, it's a pond with a pergola over it so you walk through that and then this is you looking back and then that's a little archipelago of islands that you walk through to get back out so that's just the entrance. So the buildings look quite black from the outside and then it kind of becomes more concrete as it goes in. And this is the kind of atmosphere of the, the orchard. This is the one of the bamboo gardens. You know, you can see it's got the concrete, original concrete floor there and just a slab of, of a slab of stone. So it's actually a full room of bamboo. This is another piece with another another pond. So it's not there yet, but it's coming, but you can see where that you've got an upper garden, you've got a far upper garden, then you've got the courtyard. That would be where that house would be, um, ultimately where the foundations are. And then you've got this lower garden. And then 
bits of found slab, bits of planting, bits of paint, fast cuts. Um, so this becomes a fernery. This is um, pieces of piece of sculpture by a friend. So the kind of the sort of raggy interiors, no roofs, sometimes with roofs. And then uh, these are drawings, these are little drawings that were made of the original, very, very early on of the project with the building in the middle, which hasn't manifest yet. I just put them in here because they're kind of, they do give you a sense of this um, imagined Ireland, let's say, or this kind of, this uh, walled compound that you need, a, that a, you need, a, you need to know the number to get in the gate. Um, that it's not really a landscape at all, that it's a that it is actually kind of a world in it, unto itself. So this is the this is the this is it, it is as found. So there's that pile of granite stones. And there on the left is the kind of the doghouse, the propelia. And you and you can see bottom right those walls going in there. Um, and that sycamore is gone. And now this is what it's like now, which I really which kind of I think is the promise. Um, uh, and that's all I have to, to say. Thank you, Tom. So inspiring. Not too long, no. No, no. Maybe too beautiful, but not too long. <laughs> beautiful is never too long. Um, Tom, thank you. Thank you for sharing all this with us. It's very genuine work. Very genuine work. Um, if you like, I would like to open the floor for questions coming from our audience tonight. So if you would like, if you have a question for Tom, then probably Inge can, can bring you on the stage into the limelight so you can talk with Tom more or less directly, although via Zoom, but we prefer to do it like this instead of dealing with questions from the chat. So we would like to have a direct conversation between people from the audience and Tom, if you would like, and I'm asking this question to the audience now. So you raise your hand and then Inge will bring you in touch with Tom. Anyone have a question? Mora, maybe you have a question for Tom, Mora. You must have seen things that really, really, really fascinate you. I think they are afraid of you, Tom. Mm. Ah, Enrico, Enrico, you have a question for Tom. Can you can you, can you bring Enrico in touch with Tom? And Mura also raised the hand. Okay, I think I mean. <laughs> okay, Enrico, go ahead. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, lecture. It was really, really inspiring. I had a question on, um, if you see uh, this struggle between uh, the will to create an order and uh, this uh, nature that you know, on one side pushes you and these buildings. Uh, and I wanted to know a little bit more on how you control the process uh, because uh, we have seen at the beginning uh, this very, uh, also, I don't know, intuitive and emotional sketches and then read the relation with the constructive drawing and uh, this uh, uh, instead very precise uh, drawing, what is the balance uh, between yeah. them in uh, uh, this very long process. Uh, I uh, heard that the beginning was 15 years, so I can imagine it was, was quite uh, long and... Uh, mm. the, the, yeah, it's a really good question. It's a re I mean, the the... It seemed to me at the beginning, you know, there's, there's this, there's, there's this, uh, I think it's um, Lawrence Page said, um, 
if you he was a famous garden designer and he said um and i think ram kohlhaas said more or less the same thing he said if you're going to do something do it as big as you possibly can so uh, when i was looking at it first i kind of knew that i had to make a move on it that would with the minimum kind of leverage would do the maximum to it if that makes sense that somehow one couldn't leave it alone that it was it was it, it was promising but that it had to be kind of changed to be um accelerated so i was looking for some move that would turn it upside down that would not cost me an arm and a leg or something that i could do myself or do some of myself so when i realized that I had to take down the building at the front. So I had the seaside to have the view. And then I realized that I had a sump for raw materials. And then if I made a wall, if I walled the orchard, that move, just that idea, that was all I needed to have. And then all of the other idea, all of the other stuff that you're talking about are is a different grain of thinking. So with 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 the first move there was no drawings that was a walked on the ground and put a peg on the ground with a man who poured concrete and dug holes and put another one and another one and another one and they just did it they drew it with a machine dug it out and poured it but when you go when you go they don't want drawings people like that don't want drawings <laughs> they don't they're not interested in drawings um, um uh, and in fact if you give them drawings it's going to cost you more you know those guys were engine they were those guys made basements that's what they did and they they were just very happy to and they charge you by the linear meter so but when you get then off that to an, to the next scale like the buildings and so on then you need to draw and you need to think about it because you know when you're trying to plan if you're doing the same thing again like in the loft now we have four walls with 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 apertures that we can fill now, how do we make a room out of how, what kind of rooms do we make in here and, and it's almost the same gag isn't it in a way except it's, the difference is now we keep the outside and we put we, we put a cross on the inside and then and now we've got four fields on the ground floor and we've got a clearing at the top so it's kind of the same thinking at a different scale but now but now you're starting to charge up the section and then if you look at the law the the office very little happened we just made a porch basically you come in under it you end up over it so that it makes a little spiral you have a sense of a spiral that it closes itself rather than being something that goes back and forth all of the time so so that one was an, an insertion of an object and then and then and then the last one which is the which is the, the bedroom down below the pleasure in that is is solving the structural problem as the glazing as the framing that, that's that's just lovely i think it's very satisfying and to get a room that's a mirror that's a glass room inside this mossy concrete walls and i i imagine that it's going to behave in a really interesting way um in, in terms of ter thermodynamics and in terms of what's going to grow there but again that's another kind of scale of thinking isn't it finer down so i think that actually and and with the benefit of, of the time and rico i would have thought that that actually they are different scales of thought that you go, okay, now I'm thinking at this scale and now I'm thinking at this scale, you know, or now I'm thinking about plumbing. So what, what, so let's have a tap beside the stove. That would be nice. That means that the kettle is no longer the hostage of the kitchen. The kettle becomes something in the tea house. It's a special thing because it never leaves, you know, it never leaves the tap. You don't go out there to fill the kettle. The kettle is always, on the floor so you start thinking again at a different scale does that does that make sense no no yes i i think it, uh, it does it was a really interesting answer also <laughs> mm -hmm. thank you very much pleasure thank you for the question it's a good one thank you enrico and tom um, we had another hand raised i think it was morag's hand yes there she Hello. is, Mora. Hello, Tom. Thank you for this lecture. It was very inspiring. Um, and I don't know if I can call this intuitive building, but 
I would love to do it also myself. <laughs> um, and I wonder how do you find, how do you start this kind of project? How do you find someone who wants to build without knowing what will happen or beforehand what will come out or do you build for yourself? Is that this the solution? Is, yeah. this, is, <laughs> this is, this is, this is, this is, this uh, is, this is, yeah, this is private. You're doing it for yourself. Yeah. Um, uh, how those things happen. I think they can happen. Actually, I think you can have relationships like that. I think that a lot, I, I don't think it's precluded. Um, um, uh, I, there's something about, how does it happen? There's something about the flintiness of our training, right? You know, when, when people say self-build, I feel a bit, ooh, not so, this isn't self-build. We, we have our training. So we're applying our training to self-build problems, slightly different thing. And I think it's in there that it becomes really interesting. You know, like, you know, like you're still, you're still in your mind thinking about typology when you're, you know, it's a shed roof. It can't be pitched. A pitch roof means it's a, te means it's a temple. It's a shed. It can't be pitched. You know, you're, you're going through all of these kind of ramifications in your, in your mind, but you're also buying the screws and cutting up the piece of wood to put it together. So I, I think that, so I think that there's something about our discipline um, that um, makes this work I don't know, you know that kind of argument between professional and amateur. Do you want to be the lover or do you want to be the professional? Like it's kind of it's sort of, there's some, I think that's where it's really kind of compelling actually. Or, you know, you like, you look at the the cabin on by Corb, you know, when Corb made that, when he's sitting in there, he's the biggest architect in the world. He's sitting in his little hut with a mirror on the back of the, on the back of the shutter, laughing, sharpening his pencils, drawing cities. It's kind of a sort of a, I think it's a, our fundamental kind of pleasure in making things up and you're just allowed to do that. You're just kind of allowed to do that. And, and actually, if we go back to the conversation with Enrico, like the scales of thinking, the way that what you can learn through the scales of thinking, uh, there's, there's no, nothing really to preclude that from public practice. I think, I think you can do it. <laughs> I, I think, you, I think, I, I think, I think, I think, I think the good work has that feeling, doesn't it? Normally, anyway. Yeah. yeah. But would you not call it intuitive building then? No, I wouldn't, but I think that's all right. Okay. Why would you? I think like, yes, I would call it intuitive building because you, you think about what you're gonna build while you are building it and you don't begin with a plan or anything like that oh but yeah i know i i know i i i know you'd i know you'd know you'd know exactly what you're doing you're just yes. worried about it while well, you are doing you it. may not have drawn it but you'd know what you're doing are you with me yes i, I don't i don't i think that the certain things you don't need drawings for i think Particularly if you're making it yourself, you don't really need drawings for it. And some people don't need to work, you know, a certain kind of, like drawings demand a certain kind of thinking, you know, and a certain kind of architecture comes out of the making of drawings. You know, we all love the vernacular. Vernacular doesn't come out of drawings. And we all talk about it in that way, but you, it's no point in drawing it. It's not, it's, it's like, it's like um, dancing about singing or something, isn't it? It just doesn't, doesn't happen that way. It's a different kind of intelligence about saying, I've got two by fours, two by fours go together like this. How far can I push them? Can we get them to here without joining them? I don't want to, I don't want to buy two of them. I just want to buy one of them. So therefore, is that the length that we're going? You know, it's that kind of thinking. And out of that, very suddenly, buildings become elegant. It's really weird. Like the sizes of things, like when you're not cutting things, or you're trying not to cut stuff, or else you're cutting it an awful lot. <laughs> but you, you're with me. That it is there's actually a fantastic. The projects kind of draw themselves, particularly if they're given foundations, as I've had the benefit of here. 
All I'm doing really is roofs. <laughs> okay. But I don't think it's, I think it's, I think that it's not, it's not like you kind of get up in the morning and yawn and go, yeah, I'm thinking a triangle. No, no, of course not. That's, that's what you were saying before. Like we have our, um, like. Our discipline. Our discipline. Yes. Yeah. So we have this background. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Really nice. But it is amazing though, on the other hand, like it is amazing what happens when you, when you're in, really engaging with the place and its situation and a problem, and you know it's a problem. You're going, that's a problem. I don't like that. That's a problem. I've got to fix that. And then, but if you're given enough time, you realize that maybe that's not the problem. That's not the problem. It's it's actually this thing over here, or you find yourself solving things in a very strange way that you'd never have predicted. That are perfect. You know, you go, yeah, that's it. It's solved. But you would never, it, it won't come out of the, the handy tool bag of, you know, solutions that we learn. That's probably what's so inspiring about this project, mm. I think. Mm. And ugliness becomes a question of degree and all of that. So beauty becomes debatable as well. And, and, and then what's really lovely about it, to be honest with you, I was saying it more to, to Joe, like, like now, like 10 years in or whatever, it's starting to kind of talk back and it's kind of surprising the things that are starting to happen that I would never have found myself doing or predicted, you know, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Or even, you know, even the, even the, even the kind of, um, yeah, I think that's really a real pleasure to be allowed to be in a place and to work in a place for a very long period of time. I think that's a real honor and a pleasure to really get to do that rather than, you know, providing a service and building a house and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and saying goodbye and walking off with the, after a year or whatever, or four years or even, this is a really different thing. This is making a thing, making a place. This is making a three dimensional place, like an acre, like, like every square inch of that building is built, of that place is built, it's an acre. It's a building that's that big. It's a very big building. And then you go, whoa, <laughs> totally constructed. Every square centimeter of it dug through many times over. Then you kind of go, well, no, no, this is, this is actually, this is kind of beyond, this is beyond practice. This is something else mm -hmm. potentially. And then you realize that people do it all of the time. You know, all of those great projects that you go to see, if, if you put the procurement aside, it's that level of intensity is what's delivering the, you know, the kind of jewels of energy that you're getting from these kind of places. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> it also reminds me of like the lecture of last week of Theodor Meyer. I don't know if you saw it, but... He was also like making his own space or place, but it was also from him, himself. Like, I think that's almost like when you want to build something like this and take your time for it, it almost has to be for yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's a really good thing. I hope you get to do it. Yes, me too. <laughs> start, start early. Okay, early as possible. Time. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Maura and Tom. Um, maybe, Tom, unless um, somebody else would like to ask a question, I, I may have a question. Uh, Inge, do you have someone else with a question there? Because then we would do that first. Not at the moment, no. Not at the moment. So well, I, have, I have a couple of questions, but maybe uh, a question that came to my mind is, of course, um, looking at this density and this intensity, as you say it, Tom, um, and working like this, uh, if we assume that there is such a thing like normal architectural practice, let's assume that this is something that exists. How difficult is it for you to go back to normal architectural practice when apparently you are completely absorbed by doing the things that we have seen tonight. 
what does it feel like for you if you come I back mean, into the world after this withdrawal? I can't. That's the problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I so. I can't. I yeah. I can't. Just, yeah. It seems pointless. Yes. So, and do you have any idea how you are going to deal with this? Um, yeah, I, I think that I think that I'm going to finish this out, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to um, then I'm going to start painting it, and then I'm going to start filming it, and then I'm going to start dancing it. And, and after that, then I, 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 you know, I'm just going to work my way out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it will bring I think it will it's, it will start its own work. I'm doing a project at the moment, doing a show at the moment called I see art, which is a big, big sculpture room, a big room, a drawing room. And if I think everything that I kind of learned in this thing is in there. So I think that it becomes the repository. And it becomes the studio. It is the studio. Mm -hmm. You come and you work here and we work here and we make things here and it all comes out of here and what it is of here. I think it's one of those. It's like, um, yeah, the Eames has only made one house. Yes. Well, I've, uh, probably my question is about here. You work here, you say. And is there still a dare for you? Or is there also here? It's a bit of a philosophical question, maybe. You mean, you mean do I need to go, if, if I'm in here, do I, do I ever need to go somewhere else? Yes. Yeah, no, that's it. Mm -hmm. Pyramid, the, no, that's it. That's the point. Yes. This is, what it, this, this is what it feels like when I see it, when I hear you talk. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, you seem uh, almost possessed by it, which in a very good way, in a very gentle and genuine way. So this was my, yeah, my first question and um, I'm not surprised by your answer. Uh, it's part of becoming of age, I suppose, as well. Yeah. But then I have this other question, which is a, a bit more, uh, uh, well, not so philosophical, maybe. Uh, what I look at is, it seems to me like a very conversational way of working. Uh, apparently, of course, conversations between you and the site, with the as found in the way that the Smithsons would call it, probably. But that's obvious. But underneath, uh, there's, for me, there seems to be something else in this conversational way of working, another layer of conversations probably between you and your wife. Uh, but apart from having conversations with other people, who are you having conversations with uh, amidst the moments of working on this thing? Over the last few years, um, I've had a students work with me here and I would try and find out what they're good at. So one person was very good at joinery and another person was good at welding and another person was the person who's I'm with now who's with me at the moment is brilliant horticulturalist. So I would have I, I don't particularly know, know much about those things. I've learned a lot, but I would have those kind of conversations. Or, but it would be like, what are we doing? How are we going to do that? Or what do you think? And there will be a lot of moving things around and kind of going, what do you think? And what, what do you think? And it'd be a lot of what do you think? Until the point where it's actually done and it goes away as a problem and it's not mentioned again. But there are those conversations uh, that I really enjoy. And then... Um, I, the design, the kind of design stuff, like the design thing, those conversations, like I would have conversations with myself about things like, 
you know, I think most of the work goes into finding out actually the language for how to solve the problem that you know already. Like, and so like those little buildings, each one of them has their own little, uh, each one of them has their own uh, order of thinking, material order, or order of finesse even, or order, you know, like the, the loft wants to get a little bit, wants to get, you know, wants to get a little bit disco upstairs and so on. And the, the, the office wants to do that kind of humble, that way it's Saint Jerome thing, isn't it really? Um, and so on, like, and so I'd be kind of interrogating them in terms of what are the, what are the, what are the, the decisions to be made on those terms. I've always kind of worked a little bit like that. So there would be conversations around, like even the naming of the thing, like the point of making, making the point of the naming like that. I find those things incredibly useful personally. And I've been criticized for a lot actually about being over-reliant on narrative. It's got nothing to do with narratives. It's actually sound. Mm -hmm. it's like you know, desert means you know or desert or whatever that just lets that just lets the project off the hook completely in so many ways and and puts it onto other other kinds of hooks so so i would have conversations about things like that and i would have conversations with with you know things that i love like caesar's bats you can go oh yeah that may yeah that's the way to do that isn't it okay you know th those kind of precedents like we all do i would do all of that um i, I don't know I, I don't, it doesn't feel like i lo like what's nice is there's very little actual composition involved because they're there all, all of the stuff is there so you're really just kind of working between it like the zigzags that you can see in that photograph there, they were a revelation. They're quite new, this kind of zigzag path. And it really makes it feel like those old, you know, those, do you know that, do you know Mirei, the Japanese, the great Japanese landscape designer, M-I-R-E-I? -E I'm fascinated by his work. I love his work very much. And I would love it to, I would love it to get to that stage where it's a supercharged, a supercharged acre, you know, where it's very, 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 um, highly considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was uh, connecting this conversational mode of working with the way you seem to be triggered by uncertainties and the way you can balance on that limit of be on between certainty and uncertainty, which is, in my view, really tempting in your work. So on mm -hmm. the one hand, you want to deal with this uncertainty. On the other hand, you want to leave things a bit uncertain or yeah. embracing the unknown or whatever I would have to call it. I don't know. I'm not a native speaker, but I'm, I'm doing my best to explain the way I read the, your your uh, your lecture of tonight, uh, which by, by which it both opens up and also remains a bit mysterious locked behind or locked into a horstus conclusus hmm. so there's this ambiguity in, in in it all that i really really like yeah the chase is really though i mean in the end the chase is really about space and atmosphere in the end mm -hmm. um and i think that might be, i think you're you're absolutely right about that uncertainty thing and that that fragility or whatever it is between those two states is actually a component of, of, of atmosphere. Yes. And you seem to accept it as a, mm. and even embrace it, which mm. are not so many people I think who are capable of doing this. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else with a question? Tom, you are the master of ceremony, so you decide when it's enough. Well, I, I'd like another question if there was one, but if there's not, should we leave it at that? It was a pleasure. Yeah. Okay. I'm learning from the questions, you see. <laughs> I think that's what's really, what you don't realize perhaps as you sit there kind of going, oh, I wish it was over. But uh, uh, one does this for the questions. Because I learned something. I haven't shown this before, so it's super interesting. Yes, it was, Tom. So if, if we do not have any more questions, first of all, Tom, I would really 
and sincere, sincerely like to thank you for, for me, this was like an unforgettable architectural moment, um, very specific topic and way of bringing the topic. So a big thank you on behalf of, of our audience and on the Faculty of Architecture, KU Leuven. And if there are no questions anymore, Inge, I think we can go to the conclusion and close the session off. Inge, do you hear me? Because I have another session with Tom right Yes, away. I hear you. Um, there are no questions anymore. So from my no. side, I would also like to thank Tom and um, yeah. And a big thank you for, to the audience for, for being here, for your attention for your questions and remarks. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone, bye. Thank you. Tom, I will go to the other Zoom session. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. You there. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye. <laughs>